on a mission, on a quest, on a search for discovering the truth. Join us on our journey to discovering a savior. All right, welcome to your church friends podcast. I'm Chris. I'm your the. All right, so you're here. Last time we talked prophecy, but seriously, how can I trust prophecy? Yeah, but seriously. Like, how can we? And especially when we come to the topic that really all of what Christianity, or if you're looking at Old Testament, what Judaism is pointing towards, just like the Messiah figure, right? Because you can look like, oh, prophecy, that's just like future events or whatever. But it's like, no, no, the, the main thing that all of it is pointing towards is this figure showing up and things changing at that point. And like, yeah. it's super important, this Messiah figure. And... Even just off air, we were talking about even within Islam, they've got different figures that they're waiting for, and they've got their prophecies for the Imam to show up and write. And there's different things, even in Buddhism, like there's another Buddha that can arrive. And so prophecies of these figures coming up, important. But as we're coming in to look at messianic prophecies, so prophecies going with the Messiah. Yes, which I thought, I was like, I got, a, I got an understanding of what we're going to be talking about. And then I started looking and I was like, okay, what are we talking about? Like, I, you know, as a Christian, you kind of get like Old Testament points to Jesus, like mm-hmm. everything's pointing to Jesus, but there's actually some, there's some deepness into really a lot of it that was way beyond even what I kind of knew out the gate. Um, so like, obviously when you're talking about messianic prophecies, we're talking about the coming of Christ, uh, the Messiah, right? That, that makes sense. Names it in the title. Real quick. Those three things that you just said mm-hmm. are two things. So he said Christ and Messiah. Mm-hmm. Messiah, Old Testament, Jewish title. Christ is just the Greek title for it. Both of them meaning anointed. Yes. So when you're looking at that, like when you're saying Messiah or Christ because it's interchangeable, we will probably be using it interchangeable. Mm-hmm. Same thing. Christ isn't Jesus' last name. It's meaning Messiah. Right, which is why the New Testament, and this I didn't know, a lot of the writers, like they'll put Jesus Christ when you're looking at like the epistles uh, to continuously point towards that yeah this jesus guy is that messiah guy sometimes even christ jesus yeah yeah um but usually these prophecies uh uh they're uh, the defeat of death the downfall of the devil the restoration of nations overcoming sin uh that's going to be a prophet like moses uh and then there's just so many others i actually have like this long list of old testament prophecies is it yellow it's not oh mine's better oh okay then do yours it's, it's, it's too long. It, like, right? It, honestly, because I was looking at it, I was just like, we could just do the thing of like, all right, on your podcast app, slow this down to 0.75 or 0.5. Mm-hmm. Go look them all up. Like, it'll be easier. And just, there's a lot of verses. Yeah. That, Each of them are attached yeah. to a verse because you're getting that prophecy. So it's uh, more than us just going through it and you being bored, as if we're reading a, reading a genealogy list, you can easily find it online. So, like, if you want the full thing, go online and you can dig into your heart's content. But just to, like, pick off a few, um, going back to the beginning, like, that's our saying, since the beginning, we've been waiting. Mm-hmm. So you get that, the prophecy of the seed of the woman that's going to come and crush the serpent's head, right? So that's Genesis 3.15. Then you get those fulfilled, obviously, through Jesus, but specifically where it gets, like, highlighted out. You can find that in Galatians 4.4 4 or Hebrews 2.14. But pointed to crushing the serpent's head, what happened on the cross, Mm -hmm. that he defeated Satan, um, that is going to come through Noah's sons. That will be the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac. So going through just that line later on that you get that he'll be a son of David, Mm -hmm. which is super important when you get into the scriptures of Jesus is actually from the Davidic line. So just even tracking the lineage all the way through, um, being of the tribe of Judah that's in there, even just some different things there that aren't to do with like, okay, he's has lineage. Uh, No bone of his will be broken, which are just like, that's a weird thing to highlight. Right. But when you look at a crucifixion and brutal deaths, normally a bone would be broken and it gets highlighted again in the new Testament that none of his bones were broken. Right. John 1936 highlights that point. And it's not just highlighting to where they're going back and like, hey, what can we say about this mm-hmm. Jesus guy that will fulfill these things? Like, if, if that's the level of skepticism that you have, then you're just not going to go with the rest of this episode. Yeah. <laughs> All of these prophecies of them just looking back and yeah. saying it happened. It's like, no. Yeah. Uh, because it was a custom of crucifixion that if they were on there too long, 
they would break the legs, right? Mm-hmm. Or break mm-hmm. their feet so that they no longer were able to uh, hoist themselves, themselves up, yeah, to, up be able to, to get, breathe. yeah. So, I mean, that's why that's such a small but huge one in there. So going back to the cross, um, being cursed on the tree, you get that Deuteronomy 21, 23, um, Psalm 16, 8 through 10, prophesying the resurrection, something, again, going back to the cross time, soldiers casting lots for his clothes in Psalm 22, 18. Um, again, there's just lots of them. I'm just scrolling through. Is there any on your list? Like, These are really cool to, to pull out. I like the bronze serpent in the wilderness mm, comparison. That he would be lifted up. Yeah, that, that one. Um, there's also like a priest like Melchizedek, uh, Mm -hmm. the cornerstone, um, born of a virgin. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we'll dive more into that one in a minute. Um, that he would speak in parables. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And Jesus definitely did. And again, that's where just like, if you want to be skeptical, you can discount anything that you want. But when you start to take all of these together, the mathematical probability is crazy like you just can't do that and then you look at okay well he spoke in parables so let's have these random guys make up parables Mm -hmm. that would be on jesus's level so that it's just like it i don't know i'm combating the skepticism part so hard but just like i really want to be yes we're looking at ancient documents we're reading the new testament and we're reading about jesus's life as a fulfillment of these things that were prophesied hundreds to thousands of years before but like, there has to be something of as we're on this discovering a savior, this journey that we're on is like, we have to be open and honest. Like, okay, there's a truth out there. If there is a truth out there, I want to know that mm-hmm. truth. So it's like looking at things, these things with an open mind. Because the same thing is true for like, oh, well, here's a prophecy. Here's how I'm saying Jesus fulfilled it. It's like, okay, but is that what really happened? I, I think really, and I don't want to say this is why you're hitting the skepticism part so hard, but it's also because there's people like Nostradamus. Mm-hmm. And Nostradamus made a lot of predictions that people were like, oh, this came through, but it was only like years, I mean, hundreds of years after his lifetime and like piecing things together. Like uh, one of them that I can just remember off the top of my head is uh, he said, and Hitler will come and like kind of conquer or whatever he did. And the idea was like people afterwards were like, oh, he meant Hitler, mm-hmm. uh, but he just kind of spelled it wrong or he was naming this river that he was born by. Uh, and that's what it, what it was. But it was Hitler. And so he predicted World War II and the rise of the Nazi empire. And that's not what this is. Right. Like, this isn't vagueness twisted. This is specificness that's then, like, after the life of Jesus, uh, they're looking back and going, whoa, that one, this one. And it, like we even talked about, like, some of the minute ones, born in Bethlehem, his triumphal entry, uh, that someone was to uh, replace Judas, um, the promise of the spirit, the his family having to leave to Egypt and then come out of it. Um, like there are so many of them that are just like this. This was Jesus's life that it's way different than a Nostradamus prediction. How about the Simpsons? Yeah, the same thing. Okay. <laughs> so, I guess the Simpsons are the new Nostradamus nowadays. Uh, they're predicting everything. Even apparently the rapture. Oh, did you see? Uh, this is just a weird tangent. I'm sorry uh, for anyone listening. Did you see the one where, I don't know how accurate this is, but do you remember the Simpson episode where Lisa discovered the angel fossil? And like they were like, oh my gosh. And it was like, it said the end is coming. I, like it's it, vaguely familiar. It rised up, like it, it came up, got up, and it was like the end is coming. And everyone was like worried that the end of the world was going to happen. Um and but at the end of it, it was like when that timey place came, it was like the end of paying high prices. And oh, it was just yeah, a pay yeah, for the yeah, mall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so apparently, there's been like this angel or uh, fallen demon remains that has been found uh, that people are kind of looking up now that the Simpsons predicted that one. But I I'm not on board with that. Anyways, back to the show. Yeah. So there's things particular to. The person of Jesus, but there's also mm-hmm. things that were happening during the time, like say the massacre of infants that happened mm-hmm. that was foretold Jeremiah 31 15. And we see that when Herod went out, right? Yeah. And we get that in Matthew. And we covered that one too with yeah. the I think the dragon and Herod. Yeah. So just these different things that were happening. Um 
really i'm just i've been scrolling the whole time that we've been talking <laughs> like a little scroll so that i can yeah, read yeah. it but like i just barely reached the end of the list yeah it's a huge list and the fact that he knocks them all off um there's the zechariah 9 9 uh, that's rejoice uh, greatly daughter zion shout daughter jerusalem see your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey on a coat on a fowl of a donkey uh that one's there there's this one i found and this isn't like any real verse to uh, verse type thing uh but this one i found was interesting it said that two times in the life of uh, david he was exiled homeless and rejected before entering into the glory uh through the first time becoming king and then the second time returning as king and uh so the the commentary i read it from said that this is a close parallel to the life of jesus himself uh being born and then announced as king and then his coming back as king but the like the homeless and the rejected and exiled part is what led a lot of interpreters to understand the suffering servant in isaiah 53 as the messiah Mm -hmm. so that one i was like oh i've never never caught or even put those two together that like even in david's life his life that he lived there were like little nods of like oh the messiah will kind of go through the same things yeah so i I was pausing because there's like a couple of things again it's just interesting when you go through um like in zechariah it talks about 30 pieces of silver to Mm -hmm. be given to the potter and then that's where you get that Judas uses 30 pieces of silver and buys the potter's field, Mm -hmm. right? And all of that thing happening. So it's just like, again, little details as they kind of story mode out and you see how it gets fulfilled, um, that happening. But uh, to circle back around to what you were saying about the suffering servant, I think that what we get through more of the thematic um, thing of messianic prophecy is you almost get that there would be two messiahs or that there would be these two figures is that you had the suffering servant, Mm -hmm. but then you also had like the conquering king. So throughout Judaism, there is a concept that there would be these two different figures. They didn't see them coming together necessarily, like what we found happening in Jesus. Mm. And that that's even where it's such a stumbling block for the Jews because of even how I brought up the the prophecy of a hanging cursed on a tree. Yeah. And like what that would mean, because how can their triumphant conquering king be cursed on a tree Hmm. so that's where jesus fulfilling both of those roles together um i think it was a stumbling block then it can still be a stumbling block now for people to come and bring these things together because it is so stark we're saying good news the king of heaven he came to earth it's like and we killed him (laughs) you you (laughs) know what i mean um but can i go a little bit further on that thought as well as we actually get into jesus's life as he's walking because here is the messiah fulfilling these Mm -hmm. things with his life with his words with his actions right um he does a really interesting thing is that when there's interactions with demons Mm -hmm. the demons know who he is Mm -hmm. and he's like shut your mouth you dirty demon (laughs) no right and just like he won't allow the demons to recognize him as being the messiah and just like why is he shutting that up and then even when jesus is doing such miraculous things he's telling people don't go and tell anybody yeah and it's like why you think that like here would be the thing it's just like well we've been waiting the whole time the messiah's here everybody get on board mm-hmm. and it's like it just seems they can call it like the messianic secret to where jesus himself was keeping it a secret and as i was studying through because like well, why um I think some of it we get from Jesus himself when he's talking about stuff, when he gives his parables, which even parables mm-hmm. himself, like themselves, yeah. he's like, I'm going to tell you this in a secret. And like, people need to search out the meaning. You got to dig into this thing. So when he's telling the parable of like the secret growing seed in Mark chapter four, he precedes that with, for nothing is concealed except to be revealed and nothing hidden except to come to light. And really when we're looking, I was tying it to that concept of there's this expectation that's there. Mm-hmm. And you see it even with the disciples, like, oh, you're the Messiah, you're the king. And everybody wants to rush to make him the king, to mm-hmm. make him the conqueror. And I think to where he's hiding that so that they'll discover what it really means that he's the Messiah. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Right. Like he's, you, you have this preconception. We're going to hide that away. And I'm inviting you in to come and learn who I really am. Yeah. 
because it's not what you think. And I think that's an important thing as we're coming in to this discovering a savior, just like we have to come and see Jesus for who he truly is. Mm -hmm both for, as we're talking about these prophecies, things that have been fulfilled and the importance of those things and what that me means, but also for like, what is he actually telling us and what are we seeing in him and what do those things mean? Right, because the, the common uh, thought and philosophy is that the, the people during that time, during that first century AD, uh, the coming of a Messiah wasn't like unknown. It was like rampant throughout that time, right? Like they were expecting him to come. They were expecting this. Uh, they, they were lining it up with what Daniel had prophesied to like, oh, this meets. So that's why there were a lot of false messiahs coming up right before Jesus. And the idea is we're under oppression. We're being, uh, you know, kind of kept down as a nation from the Roman Empire. Uh, just like David freed us from whatever Philistine and there was like mm -hmm. peace during that time. Uh, so this next messiah will come and free us from uh, the situation we're currently facing but the bigger overarching story was jesus saying that's a temporal problem i gotta free you from the the spiritual uh problem of what you guys are going through and that's why you know there was the cross and the road was different uh but i guess there's also that it's the already but not yet type mm -hmm. thing. So many prophecies yeah. are that. So he yeah. he is also the conquering king because he conquered the thing that we couldn't conquer. Um, but then he's also going to come back and conquer and rule as king. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's yeah, the, all those things in the prophecy. But uh, just to get an idea of like, well, why weren't they expecting this suffering servant Messiah? Uh, because they wanted the conquering king Messiah. Yeah, exactly. And to that point of, they were kind of expecting it. You get it as early. So if you look at the book of John, the gospel mm -hmm. of John, as early as chapter four, you have someone saying, come and see a man who told me all I have ever did. Can this be the Christ? Mm -hmm. So the fact that that's already part of just like, it's so readily available for mm -hmm. them to be like, could this be the Messiah? Because yeah, they're, they're looking back at those prophecies. They're looking at Daniel and there's certain things like, hey, things are kind of lining up that this should be around the time that we could right. be expecting the Messiah to be happening. So, yeah, they're, they're aware, and lo and behold, things were lining up. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, I like how you said that, that they were definitely, because of the oppression and having that there, that they were looking for freedom from that mm -hmm. to where, is it Cyrus in the Old Testament that he's called a Messiah? Mm-hmm. Right? Because yeah. he ain't a Jewish Messiah. He's not fulfilling that role, but he's coming as a quote-unquote savior to them during that time to take them out of captivity and allow them to go home, right? Right, yeah. So you see that as a as a role and as a function. And that's where they're like, well, sweet. We need that role to be fulfilled mm -hmm. right now. Because yeah. like these Romans, like put them down, conquer them. Like we've had enough of it, which was kind of the path that the zealots took and where you see that eventually 70 AD and kind of all that mm. happens. Like, yeah, let's fight for it. It's like, it, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, also where you would see other Messiah figures like... Uh, his name, Simon Bar Kokhba, the son of the star. Yes. He was one of the messianic figures that came up. And he was like, here's our guy. He's the champion. He's going to stand up to the Romans. So, like, that was the Messiah that they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, even, I think that was even uh, mentioned in the Bible, right? Where it's like, uh, what happened to that other guy who came and, like, started an uprival and everything? And, like, that got squashed. And what happened to his followers? They all went away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it was... It was on the thoughts and the minds of the people of that time that there was a Messiah coming uh, and that it should be like happening. So we've talked a lot about just kind of messianic prophecies, mm -hmm. kind of bounced all over the place with that. We've kind of already led into, well, Jesus in his life and what he was doing as a fulfillment of some of those things. We've talked about some of the general thought processes going on about things. And you said... It was on the minds of the people. Mm -hmm. And I want to come to one person in particular who was alive during that time. And as we're talking about prophecy, a prophecy is given to this woman very much concerning this. So we find this in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee called Nazareth. There's that guy, Gabriel. Guy yeah. Gabriel. Yeah, angel guy Gabriel. Gabriel. The messenger yeah. who showed up last yeah. time with the prophecy. Yeah. 
uh, showed up to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin pledged in marriage to a man named Joseph, who is of the house of David. Important, as we were talking about. Mm-hmm. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel appeared to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. It's like, that's some good news. An angel showing up and telling you they're highly favored. It's like, I'm on board. But her response, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. So the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then as a callback, Look, even Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. And this is awesome. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it happen to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. And I wanted to take that whole thing because Mm -hmm. it hits on so much of what we were already talking about and just brings it into like, and here's how it's happening. Mm -hmm. Because this is prophecy. Hey, you're going to have a baby. But then also like, and here's why you and why this baby and everything else coming in is just like, whoa, Messiah all over that. Yeah, yeah. Even with the with the Galilee in Nazareth part, like that was uh, a prophecy, mm-hmm. which is crazy because you talked about Gabriel and uh, that guy, that guy Gabriel, our homeboy, <laughs> Gabe. the, the archangel Gabriel, and you talked about him. Um, the last time we saw him, he was in the temple. Yeah, he was like in the temple where. Zachariah was Mm -hmm. and when he was in the temple he was just like on the other side of the veil of the holy of holies Mm -hmm. with the ark of the covenant so just like the most proximity closest to God that you could be yeah and I think we've talked about this where like the temple and the ark and all that other stuff is kind of like a uh, what's the movie Stargate situation where like connects the two realms together in a sense so it makes sense Gabriel in the temple uh but now he's in Galilee He's on the boondocks. Yeah, that that's that's kind of my point is that like, and I didn't know this until like getting ready for the show, but like uh, Galilee was like not liked by the people of Judah. Like it was not the town that they were like, this is a good place. It was, uh, uh, they were, I, I read this in a commentary. It said, the people of Judah did not like the Jews of Galilee and they claimed they were not kosher because of their contact with the Gentiles there. Yeah, and in not liking it, because in Galilee is the area, right? And so mm-hmm. the town is Nazareth. And in John 1, 46, you get them saying, can anything good come from Nazareth? Exactly. That's Nathaniel, right? Yeah. Yes. And that's why Jesus even calls him like, you're a Jew among Jews. Like, you know, like, hey, of course you would say this because, yeah, I'm from Nazareth. Mm-hmm. Um, but from the temple to, I guess in a way we could say like this podunk town, like this just really low economic place, Gabriel goes and he delivers this message to to Mary. Um, at reading it, we have so much that we know from Mary just in that small section that she was from the tribe of Judah. So that knocks off that prophecy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, a descendant of David. Boom, we got another one. Uh, she was a virgin. There's another one. Uh, this one's not really there, but just that we now know that she was engaged to a carpenter named Joseph. Um, and that's huge because engagement at that time was basically marriage. Like mm-hmm. So the only way to get unengaged is that how you say it i don't think it's disengaged yeah the only way to do all that stuff is you actually even had to file for divorce it wasn't just like give me back the ring right or right. keep it we're done type thing so it was it was more binding um and then uh from what we gather again she was from a poor community and so this is where when i read it before without that stuff in the background of my mind i never really understood her like response of like let me look at it real quick what when she's troubled yeah when she's troubled like this troubled her mind like why why this why like what kind of greeting this could be like for me this highly favored like how could this be a greeting for me um but now with all that in the backdrop of like oh i could get why she said that now um because it's 
yeah, why why would God choose me? He was just at the temple. Why didn't he do something big there? I mean, he did with with John, but like, why not one of those people? Uh, because that doesn't fulfill the promises. That doesn't keep with the prophecy of what Jesus needed to be. Yeah, because if you look at going back to last time with the prophecy of John's birth, where you have um, Zachariah and Elizabeth, again, they were blameless. Mm-hmm. They were on point. But yeah, he was belonging to the priestly division of Abijah, right? Abijah, yeah. And now you're saying that's not fulfilling what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I even think that going back to that suffering servant, triumphant king type thing going on to her, just like, really, what is God trying to get across here? Mm -hmm. Is he only found with these high priests who are coming into the temple and like, "Mm, yeah, let's just move in from that point. He's like, no, I'm going to come to this woman and -hmm. show that you don't need all of that to be highly favored in God's sight. The Heavenly Hearing Aids customer service team is top notch. In fact, let's look at a few calls that came in recently. Heavenly Hearing Aid, this is Gabriel. How can I help you? Yes, I was recently told I was going to have a son named John. I'm just wondering, how can I be sure of this? You know, me and my wife are old. Listen, I stand in the presence of God and translated that information clearly to your device. Since you didn't believe me, you are not going to be able to speak until he is born. Heavenly Hearing Aid, this is Gabriel. Do not be afraid, you who have found favor with God. You are going to have a son named Jesus, and he will be the Son of the Most High. How will this be? Go visit your cousin Elizabeth. She is also pregnant. This will be your sign to know I am telling you the truth. May it be to me as you have said. Heavenly Hearing Aid, this is Gabriel. How can I assist you? Me and my shepherd buddies just got a message from a host of angels and are wondering what to do. Yes, yes, I see that in our files. Just follow what they said and you will meet your savior. The Heavenly Hearing Aid, number one in customer service and providing the best help so you can hear from heaven clearly. So uh, we continue on and Gabriel does his traditional thing of do not be afraid. I like and I never really caught this. I think someone said this and I don't know who it was, but like usually you find do not be afraid with the Lord is with you. Like somehow that those phrases are... Uh, tied together, which is always kind of cool. Uh, then he continues on with, you have found favor with God, you'll conceive and give birth to a son, and you'll call him Jesus. Um, and then even as he continues, there's a few prophecies out the gate uh, here that Gabriel is uh, saying that Jesus would fulfill. Uh, the first being uh, Gabriel affirming both his deity and humanity. Uh, so he'll be um, human and God at the same time. And this is where we go back to that first prophecy. Uh, in Genesis, the Genesis three fifteen, mm-hmm. I never caught this, and I'll put hostility between your uh, seed because he's talking to Eve. Yes, yeah. that it's from the woman's seed. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not Adam's. It's not from Adam or anything. But it was. It was, and he's not talking to Eve or Adam at the time. He's talking to the serpent when he's giving this. Like it will be her offspring. Yeah, her and, seed. Yeah, and I never put it together that then we get to Mary, and it's well, yeah, it's her seed. Mm-hmm. Like Joseph had nothing to do with it because Joseph wasn't the father. You know, he went on Jerry Bringer, what was it, Maury? And was like, you are not the father. Uh, so it, that then is confirming that. Uh, second, he'll be uh, great and will be called the son of the most high. Uh, third, the Lord God will uh, give him a throne uh, of his father, David. And again, this is referring to God's promise to David in Second Samuel uh, 7, where he said, there will always be a king in your line on the throne. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he'll reign forever, and his kingdom will never end. All of these are prophecies. And Gabriel's just like spouting them off like, hey, this is happening. This is happening. This is happening right now. Um, and in a time that they were looking for it, and it's crazy that as they were looking for a Messiah, that they didn't actually see like the Messiah coming. But that's the thing. We have hindsight. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to put that on them. To be like, oh, how come we couldn't see? It's just like, all right, so you, you went and saw the M. Night Shyamalan movie, and you know the end. Yeah. And you're like, oh, how come you didn't get it? He was a ghost the whole time. 
<laughs> it's like, is that a spoiler for the movie? Did you catch that the first time? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I think that in a way... It's a really good reference. <laughs> I, I, yeah, look at how old my movie references are. I was going to go with Fight Club. Uh, but that's Oh, a good one yeah, that's good too. Well, he, he was blinking in and out of there. Yeah. Um, wait, wait, wait. There's another thing in that why it was subversed even. So I talked about kind of that messianic secret mm-hmm. to where like why Jesus was keeping it under wraps. But even where like, well, why wasn't it so obvious that this is who he was and what it was going to be? And even like ultimately when we get to his life and then Jesus going to the cross is that some of those things being, I don't want to say ambiguous, but it worked to God's favor because like the devil fell for it. Mm. You know what I mean? He's like, oh, here's the king. I'm going to go kill him. Like, you know, and just like not realizing, oh, the suffering servant and like how all of that tied in. So it's like even in that aspect of like, it was all accomplishing God's purpose for who the Messiah was. Secret ops mission. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Mary responds, <laughs> uh, how will this be? And uh, so this took me back to uh, Zechariah. Uh, and I was like, why didn't she? I think we talked about this even off air when mm. we were like putting the things together for the series. As why he got punished or in trouble for asking Gabriel that same question. And why didn't Mary? Because she basically asked the same question. Uh, Then I looked at both questions and I noticed the difference. Uh, How can I be sure of this versus how will this be? Uh, Mary believed it would happen, but didn't know how it would. As where Zachariah was like, I don't think this is going to happen type questioning. Yeah, because you get where she says, how can this be? But clarifies it Mm -hmm. since I'm a virgin. Mm -hmm. And and Zachariah does somewhat the same thing with uh, his question of, how can I be sure of this since I am old? Mm-hmm. But it's that, how can I be sure of this? Like, I don't believe what you're saying is true. Well, Mary's is like... How's that going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. I believe it, but something crazy is going to have to happen. Every person born up until this point. Yeah. <laughs> there was a process. Yeah. <laughs> and I haven't done that process, <laughs> yeah. so how's that happening? Uh, so that's where Gabriel comes in. He's telling, basically tells her uh, what's going to happen is going to be a miracle done by the works of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's an act that only God could bring. Uh, God alone can bring something out of nothing, life out of death, fertility from a barren woman and a virgin uh, birth. And only God could do this. Um, And this is keeping in with the prophecy again. And then the baby will be holy because uh, he was not shared from the sinful nature of man. So Jesus did no sin and had no sin. And an interesting thing I found too was the comparison to Mary's womb with the tabernacle and the temple. Mm -hmm. And just stuff I never caught honestly, until like yesterday. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, but with such a cool thing of that overshadowing, uh, he'll overshadow you mm-hmm. mentioned in there, uh, meaning that God's presence in her was bigger than her. So like when God filled the temple, uh, the temple, it was cool, but it was the presence of God that overshadowed yeah. it that was bigger than it. And that's why when you get the second temple being built and God's presence doesn't fall on it, it's like, oh, we're missing something. So that's where you go to Gabriel, went to the temple. Yep. And there's no overshadowing happening there. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, So then he'll be a son of God. So Joseph uh, would not be the father, uh, even though Jesus would be legally identified as Joseph's son. Which, Um, son of God, again, another prophecy going back. That's mm -hmm. in Proverbs where it's basically like, well, who's ascended up to there? And like, who knows who his son is? Like, who's Mm -hmm. his name? Who can tell me? Yeah, and then also... So basically, like, even the reference there is like, the son of God? Like, yeah. what? Like, what's his name? And it's like, oh, right here. He's the son of God, and you're going to name him Jesus. Right. Yeah. And all this would lead to, like, this wild speculation and even comments made later by the Pharisees of, uh, we know who our father is. Mm-hmm. Or uh, uh, the other one was born of fornication, mm-hmm. which is so crazy that, like, again, the word going around about Jesus' birth, uh, for them to throw that jab, they had to have known. Like, so when you're looking at, like, well, how do we know like this is even true as we're reading it? In its own context, it's like, yeah, they, they knew. They were throwing these jabs at him of like, I know who my father is. Do you, Jesus? Well, because they're doing math. Mm-hmm. Like, so y'all are betrothed. Mm-hmm. Nine months for a baby. Yeah. <laughs> when did the marriage happen? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's uh, a little bit of math. Yeah, simple math. Um, I was. That's that's a needless thing to throw in here, throw but it. I'm I'm going to anyways. Go for it. Is that you'll name him Jesus? Mm-hmm. Jesus, 
It's a name that we all know him by, right? Ah, uh, yes. Except you go back to Greek because there wasn't the hard J sound, so you have more Jesus mm -hmm. if you're speaking in my poor Greek, right? But then you look at, that's weird. Why are you going to name this Jewish kid a Greek name? Right. And that's where if you've ever heard on the interwebs and anything else, people calling him Yeshua mm -hmm. or Yehoshua, which is basically Joshua. Again, as we're reading, understanding that the New Testament was written in Greek, and just like if you're going into another language, you're probably going to carry over the name into how they use mm -hmm. that name. Yeah. And then just because Greek to them was like English in our world, do you feel like, I feel like you're going to cut me off. You have a smirk on your face like it's wrong. It's all Greek to us. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. I could. <laughs> You had a smirk yeah. like you were going to um actually me. I was no. like, I just said a lot of stuff. No, no, it's just that stupid comic popped in my head. And I was like, hold it together, Chris. Don't smirk. And then it happened. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so just on that point, it's not mm -hmm. a highly important thing. Yeah. But I know that people can make a big deal out of it. It's not that big of a deal. No. And even if you like, some people want to get way too crazy with it. If you want to look like, well, a prophecy should be that in the Old Testament it says, and you will call him Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. And it's like. Well, they didn't name him Emmanuel, even if they named him Yeshua or Yehoshua mm -hmm. or Jesus. Like, where's the Emmanuel at? It was like Emmanuel meaning God is with us, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at here is, as you're saying, the Son of God, it's the Holy Spirit overshadowing God is with us, God in the flesh. So that's what you're going to call him. Like, here he is. It's God in the flesh. Yeah. So again, it's not like we're trying to twist these things around how you said it earlier in Nostradamus. It's like, yeah. but there is a correct way of viewing it in context. Right. I guess that's what. But some people, they'll, they'll refuse to use the name Jesus. Yeah. That's not his name. I do that sometimes here just to mess with Justine. It, it like frustrates her. They're like, Jesus. I was like, actually, his name was uh, Yeshua, which is Joshua. And she's like, can we just call him Jesus? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But it's more of like I do it as an annoyance. Everyone called me Murdoch. <laughs> yeah. And that's not your name. Uh, I did that to myself. Yeah, <laughs> you did. Uh uh, so Mary didn't ask for us. So I told to you it was way yeah. off. It was going to get us back on the train. Uh, although Mary didn't ask for a sign, uh, Gabriel gave her one. Elizabeth is pregnant. Uh, the uh, repetition of information is to emphasize the trustworthiness of Gabriel's words. So, hey, we could trust him. Uh, and then uh, I love that you read. I don't know what translation you read. Berean. Berean. And I like that they have it phrased this way. So the old NIV that I read from my physical Bible is nothing is impossible with God. But the newer NIV translation uh, put it, no words of God will fail. Yeah. And I do like that so much more. You know, it's, it's that nod to Abraham and Sarah, but it's like all the things that you've read, all the Old Testament prophecies, all the things even that were said during that, those quiet years, but were being rumored and, and talked about somewhat, all those things. God's word is not failing. Here it comes from Genesis 3.15 to, what is this, Luke 138 his words aren't failing mm -hmm. and i love that better than nothing is I, I nothing impossible with god is great but this is just more of like a it gives it more precision right yeah like the thing that seems impossible is the word that he's put out there it's like that ain't impossible yes all right old barren woman have a baby right all right virgin have a baby have a baby uh so all of this is great. Uh, and then Mary's response is, if this is what God wants, then I'll do it. Uh, but I just started thinking, too, like the responsibility that was placed on Mary. Now, this is the promise that the people have been waiting for for, for thousands of years. It's the promise that they, they needed and what we needed. Uh, and this promise was being fulfilled to Mary would bring her pain and shame. And I think there's some of that mentioned later that we'll probably cover, but uh, it's going to bring her pain. It's going to bring her shame. Uh, so her words carry more weight than what we think. I know what they'll say behind my back. I know what they'll think of me. I'm willing to follow through with it. It, it says a lot. And, and I know like Mary is a great example of what happens when God's grace is at work in us. But like, I don't want to over inflate Mary as some people have. Uh, but just more of her willingness, like her ability to do it. It just says so much. It's a great example. Before I circle back around to that, because I feel like another thing happened in there. Um, you said it, and I just wanted to make one connection to where when you said that she asked for the sign, and he said Elizabeth has a, mm -hmm. has a child. 
going back to verse 26, where it leads off of, in the sixth month, God sent the angel. Yeah. That seems like, okay, in the sixth month. But the sixth month of what? It's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And Elizabeth which, was hiding for five months. Yeah. So it was just like, even God throughout that, like, he could have done whatever, and, like, Mary could have went knocking. But it's like, if Elizabeth went and secluded herself, which mm-hmm. I don't know what seclusion looks like back in those days. Like, I don't think it's just like she's hiding in a room. She, like, I don't know, wherever seclusion was. But when she came back during the sixth month, Gabriel coming then, he's like, you want to sign? Like Elizabeth is mm-hmm. like readily available. So just little details that. And it goes back to what we talked about at the, the beginning of this series uh, is Luke. Luke doing his investigative uh, research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I read somewhere that uh, the tradition is that Luke got the information about all of this directly from Mary herself. Mm-hmm. I so, can see that happening. You know, when we do read that in six months, it was like that's connecting the dots to what we just read. And, and you know, that's what Luke did. He took went. If you're going to discover a savior, you got to go to the right source. Mm -hmm. So who's the better source than the lady that had the savior in her womb for like nine months? Okay, so now you're interjecting new things for me to (laughs) spaz on for a second. Bring in Luke, Mm -hmm. going and getting firsthand accounts. When we're looking at these things being prophecy, the New Testament record is the best attested ancient document Mm -hmm. that possibly could ever exist like it sets the gold standard for anything you could ever want and just like as a historical document tracking stuff it's like is very reliable in those Mm -hmm. respects now if you just want to discount it because you don't think that what it says should exist then like that's the whole thing and that's your opinion but like the facts of it is even secular scholars look to the old the to the new testament like yeah that got written right after the events and the progression of it throughout time hasn't been really altered and like the mm-hmm. textual integrity that's there is like legit. Mm-hmm. So when you have Luke going and getting these first hand accounts and when you see how verifiable those things are, bringing this to the point of prophecy, you kind of couldn't ask for a better confirmation that like, hey, if these things were prophesied in the Old Testament, that like when they're saying, well, here's where it actually came to mm-hmm. play. You, you couldn't ask for better proof and everyone, well, I want it to happen during my day. It's like, okay, well, outside of you probably still not believing even if that happened, yeah. this is what it was. Right. And for the purposes of what it was, like there's all kinds of reasons why it happened at this time. So that was just one of the little segues of, like you said, Luke went out and did the thing. Mm-hmm. It's just like, and we can trust that. Yeah. Are you waiting for me to do the other thing? Yeah. <laughs> all right, the other thing. You were saying that you didn't want to inflate up Mary too mm-hmm. big. Which I know that when you get into on the side of uh, maybe within Catholicism mm-hmm. and you can get her as the, I'm not going to use the fancy Latin, co-redemptor and co-mediator that a lot of the ways where they look at Mary to come in and be like, oh no, you're right there. You're part of the mediator. And like, in fact, I don't know if I can even go to Jesus, but you're his mom. So I can go to you because then you can get Jesus to come do the thing and your involvement in my mm-hmm. redemption and all this stuff. And she's like, I feel like when I'm studying those things, like that's where you you go a bit beyond and like, yes. So I, I think that there is that upper barrier. But when I bring it into how holy and righteous and meek and just wonderful Mary is, like, come on, she's chosen to be, so you, you, you're talking about the temple. She's chosen to be, the ark Mm -hmm. she's chosen to be Mm -hmm. the temple to hold the messiah to hold like you know god within her womb chosen to be the mother of god trusted to raise this child up Mm -hmm. and like we can go with okay well he's god so he's just going to go on his own god path anyways like until you get in Jesus' thing where he grew in wisdom he grew in stature he grew in right and you get those things just like so mary as a mother was like the mother chosen for Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God, to right. go on the right path. So it's just like, I know that there can be the reactionary thing against like, whoa, a lot of stuff gets said about Mary, mm-hmm. but it's just like, at the same time, I want to challenge our evangelical friends to like, bump up your respect. It's like, it's fine to have a greater respect for this mm-hmm. woman. And to even by, dang, as far as any woman goes, like, oh, let's highlight all these women in the Bible. It's like, if we're going to highlight any woman in the Bible above any of them, 
I'm just going to go with the pitch and say that it should be her mm-hmm. and be like, man, who who would I want my daughter to be like? Mary. Yeah. Mary. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's just kind of my side thing of not, I get what you were saying and like not even that you were wrong or against it. Just like I kind of am picking up a personal torch in that arena of like, <laughs> guys, let's push the envelope a little bit. Like, yeah. And that, yeah. I think that's where I was going with it is that like, I want to respect what she did. Um, more than like kind of what's been inflated in the yeah, stories yeah, that yeah. followed, uh, because um, as much as Mary was a godly woman, uh, God didn't choose her because of her character; it was His grace. I, I like this. I read this in a commentary, and I liked how he phrased it. It said, "God's power from the outside and the indwelling Spirit within together results in things being done that would have uh, been unthinkable any other way." And that was Mary, like you were saying. I like that she was the ark, she's mm-hmm. the temple, she was that vessel to do something outside of what anyone would have ever thought possible. Um, but I, I sometimes think we get caught up with like biblical characters. Like we will elevate a David right. or even like a Peter or someone like it or, or even a Paul. But you write, you, you read what Paul writes about himself. He's like, I still struggle with things mm-hmm. and all this. Uh, so that was kind of more of that, that sometimes we, uh, gosh, what's, what's the word I want to use? We over hype, I guess. A, a person's character and like that's why god chose them and that's why god wouldn't choose me type situation but it is looking at where did mary come from where was she she was low that's why she said i'm your servant it was like that's the lowest of low in that community is like a female made servant like that's that's the low aspect of who she was and it was nothing on her own that elevated her it was god who elevated her for that position right and within that i wonder because when Gabriel comes in and is talking about greetings, you who are highly favored. So it's like in that lowly position, wherever she was mm-hmm. at, the life that she was living before God, she found favor before God. Yeah. I know that you're saying, well, it's not your character, but it's like there is something about how you live that you can find. Oh, favor yeah, with yeah, God. yeah. Like, you know, there is that. But then when he goes on and he's saying, um, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son. That's an interesting thing to me, because when you go back to Zechariah and Elizabeth, They've been trying for a baby. Mm -hmm. And even Elizabeth after was like, oh, man, now I can get rid of the shame and everything, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just like, they were praying for a baby. Like, that's what they were going for. And, like, their prayers before God was like, man, that we could have this. And, like, you've been heard. So just like, I don't think that you have a virgin woman praying for a baby. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, well, you found favor with God, and you're going to get this. I almost feel like it's like with Solomon to where God is just like, Cool, you're coming before me. What do you What do you want? And he's like, just wisdom to rule your people. Mm-hmm. And it's because you asked for that. I'm gonna give you the riches and the other stuff mm-hmm. too. So it's almost like I wonder what her heart was, and we won't know. We can't yeah. know. But her heart in seeking God, the like the favor that she received in response to that was just like, all right. And, and you're the Messiah's a, mama. What a two, uh, crazy contrast too, where like one uh, birth removed the shame, mm. but another birth added shame. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, like that's that. I never caught that to you. Were like, saying oh, you're that. finally yeah. having a baby. Cool. Yeah, like, like, you're not some sinful. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, God finally found favor in you. And it's like, oh, God did not find favor in you. But really, on the flip mm-hmm. side, it's like, no, God's favor was all over her. The ultimate favor. Yeah, the ultimate favor, uh, which made her the, uh, what's that orthodox word they like to use a lot? Theotokos. There it is. Uh, I just want to say it once on this episode. Yeah. That that's where she is. Theotokos, mother of God. Mm-hmm. I, I like uh, R.C. Sproul's. He wrote. Yet Mary's saying to God, if that's your will, then I'll do it. Uh, The beginning of Jesus' life is marked by a mother who submits to the will of God, and the end of Jesus' life is marked by the words, not my will, but yours be done. Um, Going back to what you were saying about how he was raised, Mm -hmm. and I just like that R.C. Sproul has made that connection. I never would have even thought was beginning of his life was a mom saying, I submit to God's will, you make it happen. And the end of Jesus's life, just echoing the words of his mother. Uh, I like that. I I hadn't got that. Yeah, that was cool. R.C. Sproles. uh, That's why he's R.C. Sproles. And we're not. Uh, But yeah, that's all I've got. I just want to, for my end, and then I'll let you wrap up and lead into next episode. um, I just want to end with reading Isaiah 7, 14, uh, that says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Uh, and I just want to end with that because 
there's the prophecy, there's the messianic prophecy, and there's uh, the whole section of Luke summed up into a nice sentence for us. I was sitting here like, oh yeah, I can have my final thoughts. Mm-hmm. But ending on that, that's great. Like, I like what you said and bringing that in. I would just say, hey, if, if prophecy and seeing what it is, it's important. Mm-hmm. Like, you had the Bereans, when they received the gospel, they went back and studied the thing. So it's like, again, you can go online, look at the prophecies. It's there. You can find explanations. Like, if it's an interest or it's a sticking point or whatever, it's just like, dive into it. It's freely available. Mm-hmm. And it's also really, really cool because one of the ways, as we're saying, as you just read in Isaiah, hey, God, God's saying, I'm going to give you a sign. It's like, that's why prophecy is there. He's giving us signs. To like, mm. I'm God. Here's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And as we started off, and they're pointing to Jesus. Yeah. So that's why I loved you just ending on that one. So next week, as we continue discovering a Savior, we're on this journey, um, really looking at prophecy. I think that hopefully those couple kind of looked at, hey, a prophet, what is prophecy? Mm-hmm. What are those roles? Now there's this Messiah coming. But within both of those, as we're looking at like, man, this prophet that's coming up, John, which again, as we've told on this journey, he's going to be sh- he's going to be showing up, and now we have Jesus and the Messiah coming. We I think we hit on it more here that like Mary played a role. So next week we're going to take some time to look at Mary and Elizabeth as mothers of the revolution. Yeah, because when we're looking at everything's pointing to this, because like things are about to get shaken up. Mm-hmm. Even as we're saying, oh, this isn't the Messiah you thought you were getting. So just. As we continue to highlight these women, I think it'll be really cool on this journey to look at Elizabeth and Mary as the mothers of this revolution that God had planned. Yeah. <laughs> I got that David Crowder song stuck in my head where he's like, do you want a revolution? And then all the Christians make that ooh, ooh sound. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you said it that way, I was like, oh, yeah, we want a revolution. Oh, uh, now that's stuck in my head. All right, so I'm going to... That can be the outro. <laughs> that's going to be the outro. Uh, yeah, I should play a little part of it at the end. <laughs> Either of this one or the, the next one. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm Chris. I'm your the... We are your church friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, thank you very much for listening to this episode. If you have any questions, need prayer, or want to share your thoughts about the show, you can email us at yourchurchfriends at gmail.com. We would really love to hear from you. And if you're on Facebook, take a moment to join our group page so that you can stay up to date with what's going on with the podcast and join any discussion about our latest episodes. Also, do us a favor and follow and subscribe to the show on whatever podcasting platform you listen to, and then leave a review and ratings. Most importantly, share this with a friend. They will thank you for it, and so will we. And finally, be sure to go check out the Christian Podcasters Association Network for other quality Christian podcasts. Don't forget to check out our website, yourchurchfriends.rocks. Again, that website is yourchurchfriends.rocks, because we rocks.